Welcome, today we are having a bit of storytelling with 5 interesting tales that may be paranormal. If you find this type of content entertaining and want to see more don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Recognizing the realities behind a situation is certainly crucial in discerning the overall truth, but it also means a great deal to someone if they are willing to acknowledge facts. At about 1.03 a.m. on Monday, July 5, 2004, my wife finished a blouse she was making. I mentioned the time for an important reason. Because she had been sitting for so long, she wanted to stretch her legs. We often take walks in the evening, so we decided to travel just a couple of blocks up Fairfield Avenue, by our house. We had just about gotten to the intersection with Ravine when we saw a shape jump off the sidewalk and into the bushes. We recognized it for the cat that lived in that house. I had mentioned in a thread about the increasing presence of roaming house cats and large anomalous cats that they seemed to be acting like an ancient sign of impending disaster. We had never seen this cat roaming before, but it was now. As we approached the house, we saw a shape on the sidewalk. Getting closer, we saw it was a bunny, perhaps no more than a month or so old. The cat had apparently caught it and was bringing it home when we startled it. Had my wife not finished the blouse at precisely 1.03 a.m., and had she not felt like going for a walk at that exact moment, we might never have been where we were when we were there. I have mentioned that if someone acts by God's will, God will arrange for things to occur so that they can do what's needed. The bunny's legs were jerking and spasming. We didn't know what we could do. We considered trying to nurse it, but, at that age, and possibly mauled, we didn't know if we would do more harm than good. We also considered calling the ASBCA but we weren't sure they would even come out for something like this. Reluctantly, we walked away. While we walked, we discussed the cat being able to attack the bunny so close to its house. West Caldwell is not that suburban an area. And we had not seen anything like this before. But, in the recent past, wholesale development has ripped up immense parcels of woodland throughout the state. And this has displaced huge numbers of wild animals. The only place they can go is into residential and city areas. We saw wild turkey from North Caldwell to West Orange, a red fox was on the street in Essex Fells, a rabbit and deer were on the same lawn, at the same time, in West Caldwell, and skunks were even seen in Orange. Politicians are cutting out their careers based entirely on claiming that they are reigning in development, but the exodus of wildlife onto city streets acts as an embarrassing, if silent, witness to the apparent shallowness of their words. The recent outbreak of hostility, even enmity, toward animals among politicians, has become another witness to the state of affairs. The use of Nazi-style gas chambers for Canadian geese and bear hunts are only two examples of this, and we have written numerous letters to the editor about that matter. The fact that the bunny's family appeared to have been forced so close to residential areas that the bunny could be mauled by a house cat seemed only one more case in point. Possibly because she was upset about the bunny, my wife didn't feel like going the whole way up the street. About halfway to the next intersection, she decided we should turn around. On the way back, I considered taking a picture of the bunny to act as a kind of poster child for the destruction of wilderness areas. When we got to the house, we found that the bunny had upright itself and was sitting in the frozen position rabbits take on in the presence of enemies. We felt we might be able to nurse it back to health now. My wife decided to go back to the house to get a box and carry the bunny back while I stood guard. A minute after my wife left, the cat suddenly appeared again, from behind a shrub. If my wife hadn't decided to turn back when she did and recommended that I remain with the bunny, the cat could have returned and killed it. If someone acts within God's will, God will take action to make sure they can. For the next ten minutes, I stomped my foot and gestured at the cat, while it glared at me, stopped back and forth, and edged closer to the bunny. Eventually, my wife came back. Holding the box in front of the bunny, we nudged it in. Then we walked home. At home, we put the box on the lawn and placed a few shreds of lettuce and a small saucer of water in the box. In the morning, we found the bunny out of the box, some distance away, and nibbling at some clover. We were feeling more confident in being able to recuperate. By the afternoon, though, we found it further away, still lying on its side and breathing heavily. When I checked it about an hour later, I found it dead. In retrospect, I think the owner of the property may have arranged to have the lawn sprayed with herbicides. But this wouldn't have happened if New Jersey politicians hadn't sold their souls for a buck. I dug a hole under a nearby bush, placed the bunny's body in it, covered it, and said a prayer. My wife had especially suggested that I say a prayer when I had finished burying the bunny. Turning back, I saw some clouds that looked strange and possibly chemtrail-related. 
I have photographed anomalous clouds, for instance, on Chemtrail Central. I looked around to see how many odd clouds there were. Then I looked toward our house. Hovering over it was a formation, composed of a large circular cloud with a separate formation at the center. It was not rendered in the exact form you may expect in a painting, but the figure in the center of the circle looked like the face of God, angry and frowning. It was so large that I was not able to get the entire combination in a single picture. Had I not buried the bunny under the particular bush I did, when I did, I would not have been in a position, as I turned around, to see the formation right above our house. If someone acts in God's will, God will make arrangements so that they will be able to do what's necessary. The remorseless, the conniving, and the icy-hearted will immediately argue that this was just a cloud formation, and any imagery is only what I was reading into it. But, then, they will have to answer why it took on such a dramatic form, a form I have never seen before with one formation inside a ring formation, why it was over our house at such a significant time, and why it appeared at just the right moment for me to see it. A picture of the formation, along with a rendering indicating the face of God that I saw, is included. You will see God's eye, his nose, very clearly, his mouth, suggestions of hair, and even what can look like a wing. Interestingly, it is what would be considered his left side that both his eye and the wing can be seen on, his right side appears in shadow. And that can be said not to be without significance if someone considers God to favor his right hand. Certainly, it seems there is little pleasure in God for what is being seen in the world. Those who respect the honorable and decent and oppose the wretched and the vile, even if it makes their leaders rich, will be willing to acknowledge the true extent of filth in the world and, likely, be even more likely to be able to see the face of God. Certainly, to be denied the sight of the face of God is considered the punishment for the malignant. Julian Penrod This happened to a friend of mine, so I guess I'm not strictly keeping within guidelines. Also, I'd like for this not to become a moral or legal debate on the use or abuse of psychedelics. A couple of weeks ago I dropped over about midnight to see a friend of mine who lives nearby. We opened some wine and were chatting. After an hour or so my friend, C, asked whether I'd like to partake in some mushroom tea, i.e. psilocybin mushrooms. I wasn't so sure, but agreed on the condition that he kept it weak. After half an hour, we felt a kind of very mild euphoria, for me, this was the extent of it for the evening. Anyhow, we started talking about paranormal-slash-spiritual things and had quite an interesting conversation. Eventually he asked me about meditation as he knows I'm quite a fan and wanted to know about benefits and technique. So, corny new age as this sounds, we did a bit of meditation together. After about five minutes like this, C asked to stop. He said that he had originally felt very relaxed, but then had the most bizarre, unpleasant experience. He said that he felt something had entered his mind, had a look around and then left. After this point, he became very aggressive, strange and argumentative. This was really out of character for such a relaxed, calm, ordinary bloke. I decided to leave, at which point he said to me. All I want to know is what's out there. I don't care what it is, but I won't believe it until I see it. I laughed this off and left. The next day he called me and said he had to see me. He was very upset. I got to his flat and it was in a state of considerable disarray. He said that five minutes after I left the previous evening, the sensation that something was in his brain returned violently and did not pass. He said that he was looking at his hand as if it was not his own. Panicking, he called his girlfriend. At the point she picked up the phone, he was hurled to the ground with some force. He tried to speak to his girlfriend but felt that he was being thrown about and crushed from within. His girlfriend, N, swears that she had heard many voices speaking at the same time, screaming, and howling. She was, of course, utterly freaked out and was yelling at him to leave his flat. C said that there was a final scream, which he remembers, and he then ran from the flat. He left the door open, and this is London. When C got over to N's flat at 7 a.m., he was in shock. His back was covered in deep scratches. It has taken him some weeks to get over it and be comfortable in his flat again. This was hard for me to talk to him about, I mean, the natural reaction is it's the drugs. I am naturally cynical, though I know that the dose we had was tiny, but then I started thinking hallucinogenic drugs have been used for millennia by shaman wanting to enter the spirit world. To what extent does this stuff purely like in the mind, and to what extent is it real? Does anybody have any similar experiences? Hello there. I've been reading for a while now, 
and decided to go on ahead and add some of my own stories and concerns. My sisters and I have been the subjects of hauntings, for as long as I can remember. Right now, my concern is for my younger sister. When my parents moved from their home of 25 years about four years ago, I thought my youngest sister would begin to live free of the entities we suffered growing up. I've been proven wrong. When I lived at mom and dad's new house, I experienced very little. I heard some rustlings in the night, voices and groanings, some of which my mother and I heard together, some other isolated incidences, but nothing that would alarm me after having lived at the old house. The activity is around my now 16-year-old sister. Light bulbs have been known to shoot from their sockets around her. Lights will either turn on and off in her presence, or at times, will refuse to turn off at the switch by her hand alone. If it was strictly an electrical problem, you'd think after four years someone, anyone else would have had the same thing happen to them with the lights, but no. It's simply her. Glasses have shattered in her room, shoving themselves forcefully off of shelves or off her dresser. She'll wake up in the morning with deep scratches and bruises on her back and legs. The bruises I could possibly explain away with her being a heavy sleeper and her rolling into the wall in the night, but the scratches throw me. She has a horrid habit of biting her nails down to nubs, by some stretch, and considering the length of her nails, it'd be a big one, of the imagination I might see the scratches on her legs being possibly self-inflicted, but not down the center of her back, sometimes a continuous scratch from between her shoulder blades, to the small of her back. In the old house, as well as the new one, she's been more prone to seeing whatever it is around her more so than myself and our other sisters. She's seen white mists and dark mists that will hover for a moment, then dash through a wall. At the old house, she saw more than I did, more vivid and upsetting things. I'd go into those, but I'm trying to stay focused here. She has other things happen that are less frightening, things we're quite accustomed to. She'll feel someone in the room with her, feel someone staring at her, or see shadows moving around the room. Also, one time while she was washing dishes, she stepped out of the kitchen for a moment. She came back to find all the plastic cups out of the cabinet, stacked in a pyramid style. No one else went into the kitchen behind her, she would have seen, and no one really had time to take the cups out and stack them in such a fashion. I wouldn't be concerned about these things except whatever it is around her seems to have some violent tendencies. I'm going to ask her to keep a journal of her moods and the goings-on of the house to see if negativity from herself has any significance to the happenings around her. The ghosts of the old house were mean and cruel, but at least we were never outright attacked or had anything thrown directly at us. They relished more on mental anguish. I'm thinking possibly these things are coming from somewhere within herself, somewhat like a poltergeist thing working there. I don't feel it's anything that's followed her over from the old house, as it's not their style. So, something new, that's taken a liking, to her? Something from within her? What do you guys think? Hi, I am a new poster here, but after reading through all of this I feel like I should add my, only, supernatural occurrence. First, a bit of backstory. I am a student in Bournemouth, and this happened only a couple of months ago, possibly April or May 2004. I don't know if you remember, but Darren Brown did an apparent live TV Ouija board, and we, me and three housemates, saw this advertised on TV, so decided to make a board. We were all geared up to do it. And let me just say here that I didn't believe in Ouija board I was a subscriber to the theory of tiny muscle movements mixed with subconscious minds spelling out the words. So, the show came on, we turned down the lights and did a bit of the board. For some reason, we only seemed to get a reaction when I was involved. It was general stuff, like yes and no, then it started always going to you. It didn't matter who else paired up, it was just me that seemed to make it work. After a while, I gave up, mostly because I was scared. Not of anything in particular, but just a general sense that I shouldn't be doing it. So, a couple of hours later, we had stopped using the board in favor of watching crap TV. I was sober this night as I don't like to drink that much, but some of my housemates were a little drunk. I was sat in a chair furthest from the TV, and where we did the board, when I suddenly felt an intense burning sensation on my leg. I jumped up and saw that an area of my jeans on my thigh was on fire, so I slapped it with my hand. This didn't put it out, so I just got out of the trousers in the middle of the living room, much to my friend's surprise. I am anticipating some questions, but I would consider myself as a skeptic with a healthy interest in the paranormal. My jeans, which are thick, heavy denim made by Mecca, if it is important, now have a two-inch wide oval hole in them. My skin was not affected at all though. First, there were candles in the room, 
but the nearest one I would estimate to be at least four feet away from me at the time. I am a smoker, but wasn't smoking at the time and had no lighter or matches near me, so that couldn't be the source of ignition. Has anyone else got any ideas on what might have happened? Please reply, thanks. Jackson When I was about seven years old I was bought a ventriloquist doll for Christmas by my parents, I was living with my grandparents at the time and as soon as I opened it my grandma said oh that's horrible. It was about two foot tall with glasses and short cropped ginger hair. I thought it was great and spent a couple of days walking around with my hand up its back saying Godel of gear, Gred and better and took Charlie, as I'd named him, everywhere with me. My granddad made a little chair and Charlie sat at the side of my bed every night in his new chair. After a couple of weeks I started playing less and less with Charlie until eventually one morning I left him at the side of my bed and got up without him and that's where he stayed for a couple of nights. However, one night something woke me and I sat bolt upright in bed. My eyes adjusted to the light and that's when I saw Charlie sat at the end of my bed, staring straight at me. I sat speechless until I finally summoned up the courage to scream and my grandma came into my room. I told her what had happened and she took Charlie into her room and put him in the cupboard. I was soon back asleep in no time, when I woke in the morning, my blood ran cold, Charlie was sat back on his chair. I jumped out of bed and ran downstairs, I told my grandma, and she said that she would put in her wardrobe and lock it. I felt better at this, and happily went off to school. I came home from school around four, I walked into the living room and froze, Charlie was sat on the sofa, and my granddad was sat in his chair talking to Charlie. My granddad said hello to me, and said that my friend had come to see me, meaning Charlie. Now my granddad had bad eyes and couldn't read the newspaper without a magnifying glass so for him to mistake a ventriloquist dummy for a small child didn't really worry me, what worried me was how did Charlie get downstairs and why was my granddad talking to him. I didn't say a word I just stood in the doorway, not believing what I was seeing or hearing, just then my grandma came in from outside. She walked into the living room and started shouting at my granddad for bringing the dummy from upstairs a mighty row ensued and I was packed off upstairs. I listened to the argument from upstairs and the gist I got was that my granddad had been watching TV when Charlie walked in and said he'd come to see me, my granddad told him I was at school but he was welcome to wait for me and it was then that I came in from school. They didn't know that I had heard the argument and when it went quiet I went back downstairs, this episode was never mentioned again and Charlie was put away somewhere. Being a seven-year-old I soon forgot about Charlie and went about seven real old stuff, summer came and I went to my parents for the holidays. I came home after about six weeks away and was greeted with kisses and hugs from my grandparents. After a few hours of chatting about my holidays I went upstairs and entered my bedroom I saw Charlie from the corner of my eye sat in his chairs with a big grin, I turned and looked in at him and then it happened, he said, hello, where have you been? My knees gave way, but like a cat that has been startled I jumped out of my room cleared the landing and several stairs, hit the stairs about six runs up and landed in a heap at the bottom. My grandparents came running out to find me quivering and crying. I told them what had happened and my grandma got straight on the phone and phoned my uncle, my uncle came and collected Charlie and took him away. I never heard anything about him again. Thanks for watching until the end. If you found the video entertaining and want to support me, leave a like and subscribe as this is the best way to do so.